Welcome back, pet parents. You know that I am all about feeding the dog or the cat in front of you. That's a very individualized approach, which most of our society does not take, and I understand that. But when we talk about individualized approaches and feeding the animal in front of you, we need to have a lot of options. We need to have a lot of tools in our toolkit, however you want to say it, whatever analogy you want to use. We need to have lots of options. And because not only will different dogs need different things, well, different, you know, different dogs will thrive on different foods and different types of foods, but even the same dog will go through seasons of life. They may develop an illness or a disease. And certainly as they age into their senior years, as, as, as if we're lucky enough, right? When we're lucky enough for our, our dogs to age into their senior years, sometimes they just need different foods to thrive, to continue to thrive. So I like to bring you lots of different guests, always handpicked by me, but I am never, ever going to bring you a guest that I don't align with. And I absolutely, wholeheartedly, completely align. I absolutely love the woman that I have on today's podcast episode. She is always so much fun to talk to. She is a wealth of knowledge. And boy, we didn't even scratch the surface. But believe me, I am going to be going back and re-listening to today's episode multiple times and taking notes because she has so much to say. And I highly recommend you do the same. Who is today's guest? Well, none other than the absolutely incredible and beautiful Amy Renz. She is the founder, the CEO of Goodness Gracious Pet Food Company. And while she started out doing lots of different treats, single ingredient treats, wonderful. What My dog loves her treats, by the way. In 2021, they branched out, she branched out into gently cooked foods for dogs. And not only gently cooked foods for dogs, but foods that are completely balanced with whole food ingredients. No supplements added. This is especially heavy on my heart. The use of synthetic ingredients, synthetic vitamins and minerals, we call them premixes a lot of times. These this is especially heavy on my heart. The more and more and more I learn with nutrition for our animals and for ourselves, by the way, the more and more I learn, this is just a heavier and heavier topic. Amy explains it beautifully, and I want to let her explain it to you. So without any further ado, let's get into today's episode with Amy Renz of Goodness Gracious. <coughs> Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. And you are the CEO of Goodness Gracious, which is a pet food company. And you are doing some gently cooked foods, which I am like, I'm so into these days as my dog is heading into her senior year. She just turned 10 and she has been raw fed since the day we adopted her. But I know that every dog, needs to be fed as an individual and what's going on with them. And there are seasons in life, whether dogs are going through, you know, chronic illness, disease processes, or even as they get into their senior years, um, we might need to do some cooking for them. And having commercial options for really high quality foods that are gently cooked is something that I feel like I've been showcasing on the podcast a lot lately. So it must be the universe telling me something. So thank you so much for being here. <laughs> oh, my pleasure, Jess. Thank you for having me. This is super exciting. 
Yes. So how would you mind just, I, I like to start at the start and how did yeah. you get into the pet food business and how did Goodness Gracious start? Sure. Um, so Goodness Gracious is, uh, I started it in 2010 and I was, it was a right turn for me. I was doing something completely different. I was actually running a small software company. And um, so back up a couple of years from 2010, because to put something like that together, right, takes a uh, a village, <laughs> but it, but it, there's a backstory. So, um, so I got my first dog in of my own in twenty uh, in two thousand and seven, and then about six months later, I got a sister for her. And so, I grew up with dogs. My sister's a veterinarian. For her, that was a calling, right? I mean, she was a person who would rescue squirrels. <laughs> so, but mine, I wasn't quite. My path was not quite as obvious for me, and. Um, but it became obvious at, uh, in around 2007 uh, and 2010. So, so in 07, that was, um, you know, I'm old enough to remember the melamine uh, problem that happened with, uh, with a whole bunch of dog foods and cat foods and treats where there was melamine tainting the products, which made a whole bunch of animals sick. And then shortly after that, there was a problem with uh, chicken jerky that caused kidney uh, uh, damage in animals. And we never really got to the bottom of that, but it seemed to center around chicken jerky and, um, and some imports. And, and then about that same time frame, there was also a pet, very large pet food company who I won't name, but we are very familiar with their products. And they, their employees got sick from exposure to mold and fumigants. And I was in this state where I just did not know what I was going to feed my, my girls. And I think I got angry. I, I was distrustful. I started making food for them at home and not knowing anywhere what I know today. I definitely made some mistakes. But um, so that was, you know, it was around 2008, 2009. And then, um, you know, I, I turned 40 in 2009 and I started asking myself some pretty big questions like, you know, who are you helping? And, and I remember not having a very good answer for myself. And, um, you know, there were, there were rewards certainly in my job and, but building shareholder value and helping people along a career path really wasn't something that made me sleep super well at night. And so I thought that if, oh, and about that same time, I also learned how many animals that we were euthanizing in our country, homeless ones, because we just, because people failed them. And it's much better now, but at that time it was about three to five million. And I thought if I could create a company that makes something super nutritious and wholesome for our companion animals that have homes and takes those proceeds and donates it back to address this homelessness problem, then that is, then I know who I'm helping, right? And so that became the reason for the, for the right turn and the start of Goodness Gracious in 2010. And so when we, when we began, we were primarily a treat company. Um, we make de we were making dehydrated single ingredient jerky, a um, couple of different biscuits. Uh, we've added some product lines along the way. We still make that jerky today. It's sing still single ingredient, um, still one of our top sellers. Uh, in twenty uh, twenty one, late twenty twenty one, we added food to our lineup and. It's something I've been wanting to do for a super long time, but I didn't quite have the mechanism down in which to bring it to market, right? I, I knew I didn't want to make, I knew I didn't want to make kibble, knew I didn't want to make canned food. We were primarily a dehydration uh, company, at least that's the equipment that we have. We, we manufacture everything ourselves. So a um, little bit of a control freak in that way. Um, and we're a licensed and inspected human food facility. So raw really wasn't in the, in our wheelhouse, right? Um, being, you know, that, that kind of uh, manufacturing facility. So fortunately, the market had really started to mature a lot in this whole gently cooked space. And, you know, it's, it's a gateway to raw for some people. It makes, uh, 
parents feel a little bit, you know, that might be concerned about food safety and handling techniques, you know, it gives them an answer. Um, but, you know, I raised my dogs on gently cooked food. I raised that first pack on them and I raised the one I have now on it. And, and it really is, we preserve, and I think sometimes there's this thought that maybe we're destroying a lot of nutrients when we when we gently cook foods, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that. But but you know, humans live on a on for the most part on a gently cooked diet, and unless we're eating ultra processed foods and cooking the crap out of something, there's really a lot of nutrition that's still in that food, and. So anyway, so I thought that if I could create, uh, or I, I did, we created these uh, gently cooked recipes that are high protein, moderate fat, low carb, really uh, glycemic load of one, and um, a lot of phytonutrients in them. Because I think regardless of what kind of food format we're looking at today, a lot of really good phytonutrients, plant matter is missing in a lot of diets. And so we start to see like hypersensitivities develop because of imbalances in the gut. And maybe we'll talk more about that. But um, yeah, so that was that was 2021. We came out with four uh, recipes. We've added a fifth and uh, they're 100% whole food. So there's no synthetics in any of them. And now we have some really kind of other really cool ideas cooking up in our kitchen that um, that I'm going to be excited to mm, talk about maybe in a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, maybe we'll have you back to talk about them. Yeah, um, gosh, great. <laughs> there were so many things you said in there that I would absolutely love to expand on. And I think, you know, st stories are how we relate best to our audience and, and to our tribe. And I know for, for my dog, she, she's wonderful. Like she's knock on, I'm going to knock, if I knocked on wood, if I actually knocked on wood right now, I'd wake her up. So I'm not going to do that, but like knock on wood, she, um, is very healthy and by all accounts, like I would have no reason to go out and do any testing on her because she's perfectly healthy, but I do all of the testing anyway, because I'm that kind of dog mom. Yep. <laughs> and yep. so I know through animal biome testing um, that she doesn't have a balanced microbiome. Um, and I uh, got microbiome and further testing through innovative pet labs. I, I know she also like at the same time doesn't have inflammation markers. So like I'm mm -hmm. in this weird stage where like I know that she's good, good, quote unquote, good. Right. But at the same time, I know there are things that I can do to further optimize her health because I'm, I'm I know I'm completely right. blessed. <laughs> it's, it's, we're all pet people. <laughs> I know, right? My dog will do it sometimes too. Um, like I'm completely blessed to be in the position that I'm in where I'm not just seeking for my dog to survive, I want her to thrive. And I know that I, you know, we're lucky to be in a mind space where we can think that way and not just what food am I putting on the table tonight, right? There, like there are people out there like that. I, I get that. Um, and we just always, whatever stage we're at, want to do the best we can with what resources we have. So I have been adding more vegetable fiber to my dog's diet. And I'm slowly seeing improvements in her gut microbiome by doing that. Um, and I say slowly because I could be adding a whole lot more vegetable, you know, low, low glycemic vegetables to her food. Um, but she doesn't like them. So I have to kind of temper what I do with like what she'll actually eat. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that's, that's a very interesting thing that I would, I, I know you did like a whole presentation at Feed Real on metabolic um, health, metabolic disease in dogs. So I do want to talk about that maybe a little bit later on, and we can tease that right now that we will talk about that a little bit later on. But with goodness gracious, I also love that you are doing everything with whole foods. So we're not adding a bunch of synthetic vitamins and minerals back to the, our vitamins, back to whatever food you do, you do come up with, cause there are, there are quite a few. I mean, there is a lot of pet food out there. There are a lot of options for people and 
generally when you're looking at, you know, a, an average consumer is looking at the difference in two packages and you're seeing, you know, the main ingredients are the same in these two foods, but one of them is significantly cheaper. It's probably because it's got a premix in there. So <laughs> when you're balancing with whole foods, can you tell me a little bit about like the quality of ingredients and why that was so important to you to balance with, with whole foods? Oh, sure. So uh, interesting statistic, right? Um, the, there was a large pet food study done in uh, 2020, mostly by industry trade associations, so pet food industry trade associations. And they found that uh, and reported that of the 8.65 million tons of ingredients that go into pet food, 13% of it is an additive. So like that encompasses all of these vitamin and mineral mixes. And 0.05% of it was a green leafy vegetable. So, you know, I mean, if you, right, so just sit back and think about that one for a second, right? I mean, we know what our doctors tell us and uh, to kind of eat, uh, eat the rainbow more or less, right? Um, and, and in human medicine, uh, there was a massive study done of something like 400,000 humans, and it looked at the... Um, daily, tried to correlate daily multivitamin use, right? Multivitamin and mineral supplements to a, uh, to the prevalence of chronic disease, all cause mortality. So things like cancer, cardiovascular disease, and found that there was no correlation whatsoever to multivitamin use and, and chronic disease. So like all of the humans out there who are popping those pills every morning, not really helping you, right? I mean, your diet, is going to help you. So um, synthetics in particular are, are super important because for us, because the body does not look at synthetics the way that it looks at a vitamin or a mineral that naturally occurs in food. And, you know, not for nothing, it's not only the vitamins and minerals that are in spinach, for instance, or blueberries, but it's the polyphenols and the antioxidants that are in those things that are you know, help us with regards to uh, proper cellular signaling and um, help increase the antioxidant power of our cells. So, uh, but back to synthetics. So as in a couple of examples, uh, phosphorus, synthetic phosphorus is widely used in pet food, right? I mean, it's found naturally in meats. So if you're eating a diet or feeding a diet to your dog that has good quality protein in it, like from muscle meats, you're going to get enough phosphorus. But highly processed foods reach for synthetic phosphorus, right? And these are things like phosphates. So phosphates differ. I think I need to tell her to be quiet. <laughs> oh, so phosphates differ in the way our, our body processes so processes them. So in long-term use, they're actually linked to kidney damage. And they're they're widely used in pet food. So the largest uh or the, the biggest sources of them are going to be in all life stages in puppy formulas. So when when dogs eat a synthetic phosphorus, for example, it increases uh phosphorus levels in circulation, unlike natural phosphorus. And um and and it also increases parathyroid hormone. And parathyroid hormone is important because it triggers the, bodies to, the body to release vitamin D, which puts calcium into circulation. So you can get hypercalcemia and hyperphosphatemia. And these things are, um, are associated with all kinds of metabolic dysfunctions. So like um, sodium retention, high blood pressure, um, uh, damage to our kidneys and that kind of thing. So uh, you know, there are other plenty of other examples like synthetic vitamin D that the the chemical structure of that synthetic vitamin D matters, right? It, and that and it matters because it can be absorbed anywhere from two to five times more or less than natural forms of vitamin D that come from food. And and vitamin D deficiency is associated with cancer, metabolic dysfunction, immune dysfunction, all those kinds of things. Um, you know, choline, synthetic choline is widely used and, and unlike, choline is found in eggs, right? And we use it, we use all, about, about six to 8% of our recipes use eggs because we 
get the choline from from um, in our recipes from eggs. And but synthetic forms of choline don't behave like natural forms of choline. So it increases um, TMAO and TMAO once you in, once it's released is it's a toxin, and um, it's so it, it it it's not good for for your body. It's associated with um, with adverse events, including um, in cardiovascular disease cases and kidney disease cases. So, you know, these things, we shouldn't look at them lightly. You know, targeted nutrition, if you find a, a pet food, a commercial pet food that you really like, or if you have a recipe that you really like, and, and it's short on maybe one or two nutrients, that's a whole different, you know, reaching for singular supplements and using them in targeted recipes is a far, far different thing than what happens in most commercial pet food right now. And in most of those products, you look at them and they've got 25 different synthetics in it. And no one knows the reaction those things will have in a Petri dish, let alone the wildly diverse general population of our actual dogs and cats. Bodies are not a vacuum, right? When you when your phosphorus levels are off, or your calcium levels are off, or your iron levels, or your copper levels, or your zinc levels, those things all interact with each other, and and we can see chronic disease or just uh, dysfunctions happen uh, because you know chemical biochemically our body's off. Yes, and. The, the way I learned it was like, you have, say, vitamin A that's coming from a natural food source and vitamin A that has been made in a lab. And when these two things enter our body, our cells, like the vitamin A from the natural food source, like fits like a puzzle piece. Like it, it just naturally mm -hmm. fits into like... Right. our own cellular structure in our bodies. But this sin, like created in a lab vitamin A, it'll make it fit, but it doesn't quite fit the way it's supposed to because it's not natural. It didn't come from nature. And right. the way, again, the way I learned it was that if you are feeding like a natural vitamin A, <laughs> so a food that has naturally occurring vitamin A, and then a synthetic vitamin A that was made in a lab, at the same time, and your and and this synthetic vitamin A kind of attaches to be used in the body and broken down and and um, methylated. It does like the the natural vitamin A doesn't have anywhere to go. Kind of so like uh, it's this like gamble. Which which one is going to get into the body and get um, methylated first? Right? What are we What are we doing right, here? Right. Yeah. I mean that. I mean so xenobiotic metabolism, right? That that's when the body takes a look at all those foreign substances that it that it gets on a daily basis and has to do something with them, right? So and those foreign substances are synthetics, right? They are food additives. It's pollution. It's uh, glyphosate in our food, right? All of those things, the body has to break down, figure out what to do with. And the more of those insults that we have, the more oxidative stress those the cells of our body go through right and oxidative stress is simply that it's it's when the it's when the insults to a cell overwhelm that cell's antioxidant power right overwhelm its ability to fight it off and oxidative stress is at the root of all chronic disease right a great example in addition to vitamin a would be copper right and this isn't something that we this is a change that happened in AF by AFCO, so the American Association of Feed Control Officials, right? They're the ones that set all the rules for pet food in the United States. And in 1997, they approved chelated copper or chelated copper as a as a synthetic supplement or synthetic form of copper that can be added to food. So up until that time, it was something like copper oxide, which is really not that great anyway. But um, but copper oxide and and copper naturally occurring in food, like uh, you would find in oysters, maybe, right? Um, has a, and and liver, right? Beef liver in particular, not not necessarily any other kinds of liver, but it's highest in beef liver. Um, it ha natural copper has a bioavailability of about thirty to forty percent, right? But chelated copper, and and the body actually, when you ingest it, the more you ingest, the less you absorb, and it eliminates the excess in the stool. 
So that's natural copper. Chelated copper is a form of copper that's bound to an amino, generally an amino acid, like either an amino acid or an organic acid. And when that happens, it becomes highly bioavailable, right? It be able, it's able to pass through essentially your gut into circulation. And, and so chelated coppers have a bioavailability of, a, of about 80 to 90%. And not only that, they bioaccumulate in your liver. And so it can cause in, in dogs, in the general population of dogs, copper associated hepatopathy. It used to be that you would only see that disease in um, certain breeds that were predisposed to it for genetic reasons. We're now seeing it in a lot of dogs. And it's because there's excess copper used in as a synthetic that's used in pet food. And and it's and it's a format that is so easily absorbed and bioaccumulates and and so there are major differences to your point between um, the the structure of of a synthetic versus the structure of a of a natural uh, substance. So you know we really need to to pay attention to to those things. Um, yeah, and I think it it can be if if we are only eating whole foods and we're not adding any sort of, you know, lab created vitamins or, or, um, you know, I, I, I kind of liken this to our pharmaceuticals, right? Like when we, a pharmaceutical generally is like one little piece of a plant or something found in nature that they've extracted and, and created in a lab because they want this one little piece of it when like, really you're going to get like with a hemp plant, right? You're going to get the full benefit if you're using everything in the plant. <laughs> so I kind Absolutely. of like right. try to right. relate it back and forth to it's, it's really the same with these synthetic vitamins that are being created for pet foods. Like you're just, the body can't, it, it may work for a while and get some result that you're looking for, but long-term overall, like it's not optimal. It's not really what we want to, to thrive. Right. And um, here's, here's something yeah. scary too, to, to think about or concerning, right? Is so in 1994, the, uh, in the U S we passed a, a, the Deshae De law, D S H E A. Right. And that essentially made it illegal for the FDA to require safety or efficacy testing for any supplement, any food supplement that includes our vitamins and minerals. So prior to that, there are about 4,000 vitamin mineral supplement kind of things on the market. And the industry was about $4 billion US every year. Since then today, right, we've got 85,000 and 90,000, maybe more supplements on the market. We've, the industry's skyrocketed to be about 40 billion. And along with it, we've, um, we've essentially polluted our environment, right? Um, but, but because there's no safety or efficacy testing, those things can, you know, and we've seen it by spot checking both in, in the United States and in Europe, spot checking bottles and what the label says should be on it in terms of its dosage and, you know, how much vitamin C should be in there, for instance, or how much vitamin A. And, and it's happened a lot with B vitamins, D, A, you know, it's off. It's off by anywhere from 30% to over a, to a hundred percent. Um, so, you know, what we think, even what a manufacturer thinks they might be getting and putting in that food might not necessarily be the case, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, that's scary, but so true. And there are, so you were talking about copper, which is such an interesting thing that like everybody is talking about right now. And I think partly because it, so many people want to blame it on this like rise in beef liver treats. <laughs> um, but the, the AFCO also, did away with the maximum limit right. on copper. Right. So they did. So yeah. So they, they approved copper chelate in 1997. And then it was a few, just a few years after that, maybe uh, early 2000s, they, uh, they did away with the maximum amount of copper. And, and so very few, uh, so there's about 40 nutrients in the AFCO complete and balanced profile, and only six of them have upper limits. 
Um, so, and copper is no longer one of them. So, so it really, you know, personal opinion and, uh, and from what I've read is that this rise in copper associated hepatopathy is not something we're seeing because dogs are eating more beef liver, right? It's, <laughs> it's because we're, there's more, uh, synthetics in there at unregulated amounts. And, and that's essentially what Dr. Sharon Center out of Cornell who's at the center of this issue around copper associated hepatopathy. That's what she's saying. That's what her working group has found through extensive research and what she's actually reported to, uh, to the FDA. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, I want to say it was maybe a year or so ago, AFCO was tasked with looking at this issue around copper and decided that First off, they weren't going to have Dr. Sharon Center in their working group, even though she's the expert. And and second was that ultimately they then decided without her input that everything's just fine as it is. So, wow, not sure who's but looking you know, out for. It, <laughs> it does make me think. Like, and it's so hard. First of all, it's hard to have conversations around pet food in general because people especially when we're talking about feeding real food to dogs, like whole foods to dogs, people just yeah. go crazy around this topic, especially veterinarians and people in vet school and people who work in veterinary medicine. They just go nuts about this topic. Um, so it's a difficult conversation to have anyway. Um, but on top of it, and I think this is something that, you know, I don't see AFCO addressing at all, at least in the near future, is that regulation for feed, which is most, you know, kibbles and things that are, that are the, generally, we do have quite a few, quote, fresh foods that are adding these premixes with synthetic, um, you know, vitamins and minerals to them. But the regulation for just in general, any food that is using these premixes with synthetic vitamins and minerals versus pet foods that are being made with whole foods, it's just so hard, I think, for the whole food formulation to rise and meet these crazy requirements that are necessary probably for these, especially kibble manufacturers who are using um, premixes to make sure they meet AFCO requirements for, for minimum nutritional guidelines. And that's just a whole other topic that I don't even know I'm anywhere qualified <laughs> to, to speak on or about, but it does seem like we're really like our fresh food companies are being put in this box of rules and regulation and trying to, especially with the public, you know, general consumers trying to fit in these boxes of what people know and understand for pet food as it relates to what we have known for the past, what, 60 years or so plus. <laughs> and it just, it's not fair to me, I guess, is the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree, right? I, I think the AFCO profile, right? It was it was created by kibble companies. It was created by kibble and canned pet food companies who said, oh, well, we're, we're creating these burnt, burnt brown balls. And so we've got to put something in it so that we don't cause nutrient deficiencies in, in dogs. And so let's just dump this massive concoction of 40 different synthetics in it and call it on top of some shoe leather and call it a winner, right? And so when you want to, when you want to do something different, it's very challenging. So, you know, we've run into that. It, uh, we, we formulate a food that meets AFCO's profile, right? But it's, it's tricky. We've got to find, we've got to get a little unique, right? It's one of the reasons why we use oysters, right? Because there's a, there's a super high zinc requirement for, for the food that, um, I mean, peop the the requirement for dogs for zinc in AFCO's profile is I want to say it's like five times higher than what the uh, recommended daily amount of zinc is for a man, right? Um, yeah, 
really high. And so it's tough to find that in nature. So <laughs> oysters typically are, are the, have the richest source of zinc. And so that's the reason why we, you know, predominantly one of the reasons why we use oysters. But um, yeah, so, but the reason why the zinc require, I think the reason why the zinc requirement is, is so high and, and, you know, I'm not the first one to come up with it. I, I, in fact, it's not my idea. I read it. <laughs> It's uh, it's that these kibble companies, you know, they they well, they realize that they've got all these phytates in uh, in all this processed food, right? Because they use so many grains and things that and beans that, you know, in small amounts in dogs that can I, I deal with some kind of grain or bean, um, you know, okay, right? But uh, but they're used in tremendously large amounts in most commercial pet food and. And they and and they phytates block zinc absorption. They block mineral a lot of minerals from being absorbed. So consequently, there's this. I'm losing my earbud. So consequently, there's this problem with needing more zinc. So Afco said, "Oh well, we'll just we'll just bump up the zinc requirement so that we'll throw so much in there that um that it'll offset the the blockage that uh, that happens with the phytates and." And the fact that it's devoid of meat, which are natural sources of phytates or natural sources of zinc. And, uh, yeah. but so now you've got companies like, you know, like mine that want to meet that requirement so that we can be called complete and balanced and yeah, and have to get a little creative. So you do, but, you uh, absolutely do. I mean, I see it like just formulating diets for individual dogs. It is interesting some of the right. things we have to do to get to meet afco minimum because you know as just as a professional right i can't put a recipe out into the world that isn't complete and balanced because what right. if somebody shares it <laughs> and so yeah. it, it is it's very interesting trying to do trying to get all of the the nutrient requirements from afco into a recipe is like, oh, bless you for having and, done it many times oh, over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? What also becomes problematic or troublesome or, or troubling, right, is that um, when you then get a dog that develops kind of hypersensitivities, right, and so mm -hmm. consequently they have to be on some kind of elimination diet, some kind of they. And, and hypersensitivities can start to go wild, right? Um, so then what do you do, right? Because, okay, now maybe I can't use things like, I mean, oysters are a mollusk, but, um, you know, maybe I can't use that kind of ingredient. So where else do I get that? Or where do I get my choline from, right? If my dog is allergic to eggs. Mm -hmm. um, cauliflower, it turns out, has a lot of choline in it. But, <laughs> but anyway... Yeah. And uh, so, and these hypersensitivities, you know, we're seeing that in a lot of different dogs, but even some really great diets and, mm -hmm. you know, and that probably comes down to just having an imbalance in the microbiome, right? I mean, we, we see dogs that develop uh, itchiness and, you know, sometimes if they're fed commercial food, that's a problem with overnutrition, right? They've got too much energy actually in that diet too, in the form of carbs, but, and so you put them on more, a more species appropriate diet and you're going to fix the problem. But we see raw fed dogs that develop hypersensitivities, right? And, and in some cases, that's a function of just not feeding the gut bacteria appropriately that produce those short chain fatty acids like butyrate and propionate that are responsible for providing the energy for the lining of, of our gut, right? Uh, or the lining of your dog's gut and also play a role in, modulating the immune system, right? So so when the gut becomes leaky because there's not the right species in the gut and they're not there because they don't get the plant matter to survive, they're not making short chain fatty acids. And so it creates this leaky gut where the immune system gets too good of a look at what's inside, you know, inside your gut. And now it starts to go haywire and create all kinds of hypersensitivity issues and allergy issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the way to fix that is, is, you know, basically to 
start feeding some uh, some food, some prebiotic fibers, right? That that the gut likes, and and then maybe hopefully reaching to some herbs and things to kind of calm down that um, that immune system. So. Yes, it can be very, very tricky. (laughs) (laughs) It can be so very tricky, but that kind of leads us in, I think, to, you know, dogs that are ill, that have some sort of disease processes. And your talk at the Feed Rail Summit this year was just blew me away on metabolic disease in dogs. And I obviously don't want you to sit here and repeat your whole spiel, but um, can you just kind of give our listeners like a summary of what you were talking about with um, metabolic disease in dogs? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, 60% of our dogs and or thereabouts and 60% of our cats are considered overweight or obese. Right. And so, um, you know, weight is a, is a huge, huge factor. It's no, weight is no longer this, um, this thing that we used to think about as this piece of luggage we would carry around with us for the day that we decided we're going to go run five miles or, you know, whatever. Fat is a massive organ in the endocrine system. It has the biological repertoire for storing and releasing energy and, and the metabolic machinery to communicate with distant organs, including the central nervous system and the brain. And it is intricately tied into this thing that we call the gut brain access and um, communicates with us through our nervous system, our immune system, our, our metabolic system, our cardiovascular system. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. So metabolic syndrome essentially is a cluster of um, abnormalities that put a body at risk for obesity, type 2 diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, obesity, as well as several other um, conditions that can lead to cancer. So there, and, and various other chronic diseases. So conventionally speaking, there are five key indicators of metabolic syndrome, right? It's it's excessive fat around your middle, right? Um, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, high triglycerides, and abnormal cholesterol levels. We can start to add gut dysbiosis to that list, right? Because anytime there is uh, an acute or chronic disease state, the gut microbiome is, is altered. So, um, so yeah. So, so what? So what happens um, when? Blood sugar, so what's blood sugar, right? Blood sugar is, rises when we eat, right? So we eat something, um, blood sugar rises, the pancreas signals to release insulin, which is, um, which is responsible for lowering our blood sugar, right? But when we have metabolic syndrome, we start to see uh, insulin resistance. And so insulin resistance is when your cells in your body don't respond to insulin like they should. And so consequently, blood sugar rises. And when, when you have high blood sugar, high blood sugar damages blood vessels. And it damages the blood vessels that are in your, in your brain. And you have cognition, mood, and behavioral disorders. It damages the blood vessels that uh, feed the nerves throughout your body. And you can develop neuropathy. It, it can damage the blood vessels that uh, feed your kidneys and the nephrons, the little filters in your kidneys. And so you can start to see, uh, you know, kidney damage or kidney disease. Um, it can damage the blood vessels uh, throughout your body and the uh, epithelial cells, which are those that thin layer of cells that line all of your blood vessels, which are responsible for exchanging information between your bloodstream and your tissues. And it plays a role in your immune system. And it can damage the blood vessels around your heart and you can start to see heart disease. So, so what happens, you know, when you've got, um, this inflammation? Oh, so no, so you have this high blood sugar with nowhere to go, right? Um, because your body's not telling it to store it, store that blood sugar as glycogen, like in your muscles and in your liver. So, um, so your body then wants to store that blood sugar as fat and it's going to store it as fat in your, in your liver. And you're going to get non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which puts you at risk for liver cancer. And it's going to store it as more fat around your, your organs in the, and in your middle. So, you know, you're once 
somewhat overweight with some level of pro-inflammatory substances floating around that cause insulin resistance. And, and now you're more overweight with more of those things floating around. And those things start to dysregulate things like bile acids and, uh, and the way the body creates and breaks down fat. It's, uh, it's called dyslipidemia. And so you'll see more free fatty acids. You'll see higher cholesterol. You'll see higher triglycerides. But it doesn't end there. You, more overweight bodies also have more oxidative stress in a reciprocal way. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. That's when those insults to a cell overwhelm that cell's antioxidant power. And that's at the root of chronic disease. And, and then you also start to see gut dysbiosis because what happens in overweight bodies is that your gut becomes fragile. And it can become leaky and stuff seeps out into systemic circulation and starts to cause inflammation and dysregulation of, of your immune system. So, um, I mean, it really is, it really is a, a vicious cycle. Um, you know, do you want me to go into more? <laughs> I, lo I love well, talking about this stuff. <laughs> I, I know it's so fascinating. I feel like, I feel like I could just talk to you forever about it. Um, it, it really is fast. I think I have become more fascinated with it recently because I've just been for, for many years on like my own health journey, but recently I've actually figured out some things that work for me. Yeah. And yeah. that when we, when we find something that works, I think that just, I don't know, triggers us in some way to be like, even more like now I really need to learn more about what's going on and why and all these different like things that I can do. And I have really gotten into um, intermittent fasting for myself mm -hmm. recently. I do it um, a modified fast for my dog. So she eats one meal a day in the evening and then in the morning she just has goat's milk. So she is still getting nutrients, but it's a lot easier on the digestive system. So I call it a modified fast for her. For her. Um, and I'm actually getting ready to do a three-day water fast next week. I'm so excited about it. I've been prepping for this for a while. Yay. I'm so excited about it. But um, the, the idea like c combating disease in animals, whether that's humans or dogs or cats or whatever we're talking about, and just kind of going back in history, like w let's let's look at what people have done for years or animals in the wild have done for, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. Like the answers are there. And mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, fasting can be one of those one of those answers. But I, I think um, as much as I would love to talk about fasting with you more beneficial to listeners, I think, might be the idea of, um, you know, when you go into your veterinarian's office and your pet is overweight, the first thing they tell you is to feed less. Right. And when you're feeding like a kibble or you're feeding anything with um, that is being balanced with synthetic nutrients, that can be very detrimental to the overall health of the body in different ways than right. what being obese is detrimental to the body. And one of, you know, it's, I think it's, um, so Karen Becker, um, Steve Brown and Susan Thixton have been looking into this for the DCM issues that we have seen, um, popping up in a lot of dogs in the past number of years. But I think it's also applicable here, um, where feeding less isn't necessarily, depending on what you're feeding, isn't what you really want to do. Is right. that, so does I, that make sense I, to you as well? <laughs> it, it does. So, so I think, you know, to kind of tie some things together, you know, metabolic syndrome happens uh, it, because there's something that's wrong in the body, right? That we talked about, like basically being overweight, insulin resistance. I mean, you can come at it a number of different ways, but it's a cycle. It's all connected. And, and then, so it happens because of something that's happening in the body. And then it happens because there's something in the bowl, right? And so it's not just a matter of reducing calories, right? What you eat matters more than the calories that, that you eat, right? And, um, and, and when you eat it too, because, you know, there's this, um, thing that, 
cells go into called autophagy, right? Which is like that cellular housekeeping that happens when you're not continually sticking food in it, right? And because when you put food in it, it goes into this growth mode. And, um, and when you take food away, it can kind of clean up and do that xenobiotic metabolism kind of stuff, clean up the cellular junk from all of that, right? In autophagy. And, and it also can put the body into ketosis, which, um, you know, so you're, now you're burning fat. Um, but, but there's something that's happening in the bowl and it's not just about, it's not just about calories, right? Um, and just to Dr. Becker and Susan Thixton and Steve's Brown point, uh, to their point, I think what they are talking about too is that, okay, we're feeding a complete and balanced diet, right? But it's complete and balanced for a dog that needs this number of calories a day. And if my dog is overweight or sedate um, and does it and needs fewer calories in order to maintain a healthy weight, then potentially I can see a nutrient deficiency in that dog because I'm feeding them lower or less than the recommended daily allowance, right? And so, and, and the biggest thing to look for is protein, right? I mean, you, you want to make sure your dog's getting enough protein, but that doesn't cover all the bases, right? I mean, they're, like we said, there's 40 nutrients in the AFCO complete and balanced profile. So, but, um, but there's a lot of things that happen in the bowl in commercial food that go way beyond just calories, right? I mean, we're talking about we're talking about the chemicals that that are applied to the crops that we eat, right? Glyphosate being one of the biggest ones. That's you know, the average dog has 16 times uh, 16 parts per billion glyphosate concentration in their urine, where the average human is like half of a uh, half of 0.5 parts per billion. So, and, you know, dogs with outdoor exposures are probably always going to have somewhat higher levels, but, but what we're, but that doesn't explain that difference. I mean, that difference is explained by the fact that they're eating contaminated crops, right? Um, and things like corn and soy and rice and, um, and things. So, um, you know, you've got that, you've got heat induced toxicants, which, you know, are, are awful, awful, awful. Like this is, this is why I think one of the, why we see so much benefit come from raw feeding or from feeding gently cooked foods is because the method that you use to, to cook, um, doesn't create those advanced glycation end products or those advanced lipoxidation end products. And those things, you know, they're mutagenic, carcinogenic, cytotoxic, genotoxic. They're associated with, um, cancer. Um, they're particularly damaging to the cells of the pancreas and to your kidneys. And your pancreas is super important because not only does it responsible for controlling insulin or releasing insulin, but it also controls your digestive enzymes. So, you know, when we start to screw up that, we start to screw up a whole, you know, a whole big mess of problems, create a big mess of problems. So, um, so, you know, you've got heat induced toxicants that are in that bowl. You've got imbalanced feeding and part of imbalanced feeding too also includes hydration. So if, you know, if we're feeding a uh, dry food to, to our dogs, they're probably going to live in a chronic state of dehydration and uh, in mildly so maybe, but, um, Water is super important because water is used to make the gastric juice that digest, most dogs digest or, or most protein rather is digested in the stomach of, of dogs. And so when you don't have enough water there to make the gastric juice to digest the protein, you're going to start to see a bunch of problems. You're going to start to see things like fermentation happen in their gut, you know, in their stomach, which can cause um, reflux. You're going to, in indigestion, you're going to start to see protein particles that are not fully digested pass into, into the gut. And that can be um, an inflammation or an allergy trigger. And again, you know, now that we're inflaming the gut, then we open up this whole, I mean, the body is connected, right? That's what holism is about. It's what holistic medicine is about. Everything is connected to everything. So we start to open up the, the floodgates for metabolic dysfunction. Um, you know, in, so imbalanced feeding, heat induced toxicants. We've got, we talked about synthetics. Um, we talked about, um, chemical load and, um, Oh, there's probably one other one in there, but uh, one of the category of nastiness, but it's escaping me at the moment. So, 
but um, but yeah, it's it's not it's it's not just calories, right? Um, it's yeah. it's getting the right balance of of nutrients: high protein, moderate fat, low carb, good balance of omega threes, right? And dog, and you can test for a lot of these things, which is super exciting. Like you can test your dog's omega three levels, quant, omega quant. Uh, Dot com. I remembered what it was. It was natural toxicants. So those are things like, um, you know, that last category I was thinking of mentioning. It's uh, so those are things like uh, aflatoxin and glycoalkaloids and endotoxins, which uh, are particularly damaging to the gut. And when you talk about metabolic health, and that's a very very cute puppy you have there. <laughs> but endotoxins are. Um, these substances that so they exist inside of our gut right and they're because they're a product of gram negative bacteria and we have gram negative bacteria in in our gut um but when we eat um certain foods um or when we eat foods that don't like if, you, if you've ever gotten food poisoning it's not necessarily the salmonella that's causing the problem. It's the endotoxins that are causing that havoc in, uh, in your gut. And so like dogs that eat ultra processed foods, they're eating not wholesome sources of ingredients. So there are a lot of endotoxins are heat and sterilization resistant. They're tiny little molecules that exist inside the cell of gram negative bacteria. There's about 2 million endotoxin molecules inside one cell of gram negative gram negative bacteria. And when that cell replicates, little bits are released. But when that cell dies, all those endotoxin molecules are released. So if you think about um, some foods that make it that, that are ingredients that are not wholesome, right? Maybe they've got salmonella on them and they're not handled properly, right? So one cell of salmonella will become a million cells of salmonella in about six to 12 hours. And then when that product that whatever that ingredient is either goes through a rendering process or goes through a cooking process or is ingested, those salmonella die and that 1 million cells of salmonella will release 2 trillion endotoxin molecules. And in unmanageable levels, endotoxin initiates and perpetuates damage and diseases of the gut. And, and also the brain, the cardiovascular system, um, you know, endotoxin in, in the body is brought to the liver where it's inactivated, but too much endotoxin in the liver is going to damage your liver. And this is super important because other substances can interact in your liver with that endotoxin to damage your liver. And those other things can be things like too much copper and too much vitamin A and too much iron. And so, you know, it, so much of what is goes into a lot of commercial pet food is is undermining our a pet parent's effort to try to get their dog to a healthy weight, right? I mean, I, a lot of parents try to right size their dog, right? They're trying to and their cat, right? They're trying to reduce calories and increase exercise and measuring out their food. Yet this trend of our dogs getting fat and fatter is just increasing and and it's happening because of that ultra processed stuff that's on the on the you know grocery store shelves and things so. yeah it's like the more and more i learn it's just like this perfect storm that they've created <laughs> and yeah. I, not you know we can get into the is it intentional? Is it not intentional? Blah, blah, blah. You know, of course there are some not nice human beings in the world, but I originally don't think it was intentionally, you know, it, anybody was yeah, I think it's motivated by money, animals. right? I mean, yeah. I think it's motivated by money. Just like when, when you, when you look at a bag of Purina, I did the math on this, uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, maybe. And I just have, what else do I do on a Sunday, right? I can't say this. <laughs> so anyway, but I, uh, I said, oh, you know, like I wonder how much Purina spend on the spent on the ingredients to make that bag of Pro Plan, right? And for, and when it came down to it, like when you stripped away the profit margins of, um, you know, what what a what a store would typically charge, you know, to put the bag on a shelf, what they would retail it for, what the what the distributor. Um, wholesaled it for, what the manufacturer sold it to the distributor for, when you take away those profit margins, right? And then you take away Purina's profit margin, right? And what they pay all their executives and all that kind of stuff. To feed a 60-pound dog, they're probably spending 
25 cents on the ingredients for that 60 pound dog a day. Right. I mean, so, you know, ultimately it just comes down. It's not like anybody at, at any one of those big companies set, set out to say, I'm going to make a whole bunch of really sick dogs. Right. Okay. They just set out to make money. And, and that also ties into the fact that they own a network of veterinarian, veterinary hospitals. Right. I mean, that, that, you know, VCA, Banfield, Blue Pearl, they, they're owned mm-hmm. by big kibble companies, which if you think about it, it's kind of like McDonald's owning your doctor's office, right? I mean, <laughs> they're yeah. going to tell you to eat McDonald's. They're going to tell you to eat kibble because, you know, ultimately they, that is the mantra. That is what the people who work there are, are told to say. And, mm-hmm. and it's a condition upon them working there. And, you know, and they're not educated to, uh, I mean, they're, doctors are extremely educated. Don't, don't, you know, take, get me wrong on that one, but they don't learn about nutrition in vet school and, um, and where they're getting their information from a lot of times is big kibble companies. I, I was at a dinner, um, with a bunch of veterinarians and some big muckety mucks from Purina and they had no idea who I was, you know, and, and not that they would care. And, And I sat there and listened to these couple of people tell these doctors, oh, it's not the ingredients that matter, it's the nutrients, which is AKA what synthetics are all that matters, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the beef, it's synthetics. Um, And, um, you know, and throwing uh, and saying that um, that what's most important, they were asked what's... Um, one of the doctors asked the Purina folks, and this really stuck in my mind. One of the doctors asked one of the Purina people. So I get, the doctor says, I get asked a lot by pet parents how to pick out a good pet food, right? What to look for. And so what would you say I should tell that pet parent, right? And and there was a whole bunch of word salad there <laughs> that, that the answer, you know, okay. I, I couldn't really get understand what the, what the point was you know, something about feeding trials you, you should look for a bag that said it was done you know had feeding trials done on it which feeding trials by the way are very simple to do there are a handful of dogs and basically all you have to prove is that you didn't injure the dog right i mean that that you know the cbc and chem still look fine and like and, a very uh, short like six months or something in like a very it's a short really period short... of time right i mean the, yeah. the bar is really really low <laughs> and uh but but what stuck out of my mind was that he said, oh, well, tell them not to look at ingredients. Ingredients don't matter. <laughs> I, it was so hard for me not to speak up. And I, I had, I had sw- been sworn to silence as to uh, warrant the invitation to that dinner. <laughs> yeah. So, so I didn't say anything, but, but yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And. Oh my God. I, I just want to. So yeah, like, I think it's just motivated by money. Be, yeah. It's like, do I want to cry? Do I want to be mad? Do I want to like all of the emotions come right. up with so, that? But I mean, I, I think back onto what, what, what made me want to start goodness gracious. Right. And it was, it was to be not that in every yeah. way. Right. I mean, it was to, uh, for me, you know, goodness gracious is about a spirit. Right. And it's a, a spirit of doing the right thing for our companion animals and, and along the way doing the right thing for our planet. So, you know, and to improve our connection with each other. So we you know, we try to do a lot of educational stuff um, with the stores who carry our products and try to get the word out to, you know, this, what Feed Real Summit was all about. Right. And and share knowledge that way, because knowledge is power. And yeah. um and trying to choose the right ingredients, right? Mindfully source ingredients because pasture raised over confined animal feeding operation, proteins matter. And, and because non-GMO and organic produce matter, right? We, we can't choose all organic because we still have to make it affordable. So we pick and choose like, okay, is that basically a clean vegetable or a clean, Mm -hmm. um, fruit and, um, and the ones that are to the ones that might be the ones that are treated with glyphosate. Well, we're going to go organic with those. Right. And, um, because it, you know, it's, it's great to build something that's the best thing on the planet, but it is not the best thing on the planet if people cannot afford to buy it. 
right? And um, so, yeah, uh, so, yeah, so making good choices with regards to our produce and clean ingredients. And, and you know, for us, that also extended to our carbon footprint, right? And being able to look for uh, more recyclable packaging, compostable materials, um, more green energy. And, and so, yeah, just wanted to be not that. And then, and something that was a lot better, right? That made people feel really good when they fed it, when they bought it, when they fed it. And not only that, but, but they saw the difference in, in their dogs. And, um, you know, that, that not only did maybe their dogs right size, right? They, they lost the weight that they were supposed to lose, but, but all those things that you weren't necessarily counting on that, that came about, like their personalities blossomed and they became more playful and more interactive. And that senior dog who looked once looked like a couch potato that was arthritic is now, you know, playing with the, you know, the, the four-year-old down the street. And, um, so, you know, that's, that's yeah. the kind of stuff that I love to hear and love to be able to create. Oh my gosh. It is, it's the, it's the absolute best. And, you know, I, I, I've said this so many times on, on this show that being like starting out as a dog trainer, but having fed my dogs fresh food and then taking that and implementing that with dog training clients and having them start feeding their dogs fresh food diets, I was just putting myself out of work. And I couldn't have been happier about it. Yeah, like, right? It, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I, honestly, my 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 skin is too thin to hang in the dog training world. Anyway, that place is dog trainers are 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 crazy. But um, <laughs> so it all worked out. But like, yeah, I just could not have been happier to just see the changes in these dogs, and then have them have you know really for the most part, never hear from these people again yeah. was like confirmation for me that like, you know, so much of what we're seeing and what we think is wrong with our dogs today is just all di like diet is foundational and you can't, I don't even know who was the first person to say it, but we're all saying it now. You can't out supplement a bad diet. No, no. And it is can't. so, so true. No, can't juice cleanse so your way out of a daily happy meal, you know? <laughs> you no, know? no, my goodness. So. <laughs> There's so much work. Well, even like this um, three-day water fast that I'm getting ready to do, it's not like I have put it off a couple of times because I just keep learning more and more. And I'm like, there's so much prep that has to go into this. And it's really like for our dog, it's the same way. We just, we have to keep, keep learning, keep researching and never give up. Like, I don't, there's never a good enough for me <laughs> when it comes to my animals, for sure. There's never a good enough. I got to keep learning. I got to keep figuring things out and improving things. And I find when I do that with my animals, I, I it end up doing it with myself too. So I think there's right. just so much benefit to, um, you know, just keep, keep, keep learning and keep implementing and keep trying things because every animal is an individual and what works for one dog may not work for the next dog. And that's okay because there's something else out there that is going to work right. for that dog. And that's again, why I really, um, I, I, I'm very selective and I, of, of who I bring on the podcast, of course, but especially when it comes to like brands, um, because I don't, I, you know, I want to make sure that the information that is being put out into the world is like the absolute best that I can put out there. And I, I really love everything you're doing with goodness gracious. And I want to thank you. Um, thank you, Jess. just let you know that you're so appreciated. <laughs> um, and I, I'm just so happy to be telling more people about your food and your treats. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, of course. I'm very grateful to be uh, to be asked to be here, and it was just it was so it's so special to be here. And and um, I, you're you are a delight and um, oh. and an inspiration. And um, so it's, it's you're wonderful. so sweet. <laughs> well, where can people find out more? Yeah. So uh, our website is goodness gracious co um, dot com. We're also on Facebook and Instagram. 
and um, we are um, yeah, we we ship uh, direct to consumer, and we also have um, growing distribution in um, uh, in various regions throughout the United States. So that's expanding pretty much by the day, which is super exciting. Um, we uh, we just got picked up on Susan Thixton's uh, twenty twenty four list too for our food. So. That, that's really special. We um, we came out with it in late 2021. So the first year we could have been on it was 2022 when we were. So it's our third year in a row on her list. And um, so that's that's really getting, that's helping to get the word out there too about uh, about us, which is really spectacular. And, uh, and you too, which is great. But, um, oh, but, no. Yeah. Her list is, um, I know. So, I like, yep. it's like the Bible, so, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, so our, our food is in um, a, a growing number of independent pet supply stores, uh, which uh, we are just over the moon about because, I mean, that's where these dialogues happen for the most part, right? I mean, we're one small uh, company um, and, you know, we don't have, we, we can do, get out there as much as we can on social media and, uh, and events, but the education really happens Um at you know at the point of purchase in in those pet supply stores so those are the people that have a lot a lot of knowledge and um so we encourage uh we encourage folks to, to check out those places and and uh and if you don't see us there ask <laughs> yeah that, that's exactly what Jeremy say if it's not in your local healthy pet food store ask them about it um yeah. i know i was telling you before we recorded i was talking to the owner of the nautical dog and she was so excited to bring your products in um and add freezer yeah, space wonderful. she's i think she's maxed out with the number of freezers <laughs> she can put yeah. in now but she's like i need more and i don't know where i'm gonna put up <laughs> which is the best problem to have it as is a, as a it's pet the store best owner, problem right? So um, d definitely check out Goodness Gracious, Goodness Gracious Co. That's c c o yep. dot com, yep. and is it just Goodness Gracious on uh, yep. Facebook and Instagram? Good, uh, Goodness Gracious Pet uh, that is our Goodness handle Gracious on um, yeah on both Instagram and Facebook. Perfect. I will make sure to put that in the show notes. And Amy, thank you so so much. I hope to have you thank back you, soon, Jess. especially once you're ready to let everybody know uh, what the, more you have. New planned. secret sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Always love hearing that because there there is so much room. I, I like I know that you know when we when we think about pet food, it's very overwhelming. There's so much out there. There's so many choices, but at the same time, when we niche it down to like what is the really good food out there on the market, what is the healthiest best I can buy for my animal, that list is pretty small. So <laughs> I'm thrilled that you're on that list and that you are adding to that list. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, 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 oh.